Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hi, this is episode 196. Today we will conclude the interview with Roman Yampolsky. He was talking about his new book called AI Unexplainable, Unpredictable, Uncontrollable. And this is his third appearance on our show. Roman is a tenured associate professor in the Department of Computer Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Louisville in Kentucky and has been instrumental in the founding and development of the field of AI security. He is the founding and current director of the Cybersecurity Lab and has written many key books in the field such as Artificial Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach, and Artificial Intelligence, Safety and Security. He's been central in warning about the control and value alignment problems of AI from the very beginning, back when doing so earned people some scorn from practitioners in the field. Yet Roman, being a professor of computer science, has to be taken seriously, and he applies rigorous methods to his analyses of these problems. Last week we talked about why this work is important to Roman, the dimensions of the elements of unexplainability, unpredictability, and uncontrollability, the level of urgency of the problem, and drill down into why today's AI is not safe and why it's getting worse. For people who think that this discussion is hypothetical and doesn't start to gain traction until AI gets to the point where it has the reach to threaten our lives, let me point out that it has already exercised that reach. Not with any explicit intention or malevolence, but through the incomplete understanding of its developers which is bad enough. I'm referring to how social media recommender algorithms have radicalized many elements of our society. Without intending any such effect, the programmers of the algorithms on TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook, to note some documented examples, created processes that were designed just to keep users spending as much time on their respective platforms as possible, as you would expect of any capitalist enterprise. And so they implemented machine learning to learn what recommendations kept people engaged on the platforms. But it turned out, much later we discovered this, that it wasn't just stuff that was cute, or pictures of cats in tutus and so forth, but it was also what would make people angry or get them worked up. So if someone evidenced a love of animals, they would end up being shown videos from PETA and encouraged to attack research labs. Or if they liked to jog, they would be led towards videos of ultra-marathoners. Or if they displayed a melancholy demeanor, they would eventually be led to postings about suicide. None of which was intended by the programmers. It's just what the AI learned would satisfy the goals they gave it. I'll leave subjects like Brexit, the 2016 presidential election, and January 6, 2021 as exercises for the listener. But by now, it's been well-researched and established that what amounts to a bug in the implementation of an AI led to what amounts to mind control of a significant portion of the global population. So let's retire any notion of this being an issue that is as remote as science fiction as we get back to the interview with Roman Yampolsky. I'm heading towards an understanding of what more we could and should do about this. And so that requires some level of the risk that we face. And if you're going to spin up a Manhattan Project scale effort to do something, then you have to have some idea that you're facing, for instance, a problem on the scale of World War II. And so we're looking at something much bigger than that. But Without wanting to pin you down to something unfair, like what scale of problem do you think we could face in what time frame? Let me talk about people who now seem to want to do exactly that and throw around terms like P doom. What's the probability of doom? This annoys me no end, but I said that in a, a recent episode. What is your take on? the conversation with people putting things like that in their email signatures and 
talking about existential risk with that level of facility or facileness. So again, because of unpredictability, it's very hard to give you specific number. I think it's reasonable to have probabilities for all future events. You make certain predictions about how long you're going to live, what job you're going to have. You can estimate those uh, within certain ranges. I think the main point here is that given how high the stakes are, a very, very small probability of complete disaster completely wipes out all benefits. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like penny stocks. Yeah, you can make a thousand percent, but the chance of you losing your principal investment is too high. It's not worth investing in penny stocks. Of and this is kind of like that. Yeah, they promise us, you know, trillions of dollars will be generated, but maybe we're all going to be dead. So I never give a specific probability other than to say, if we don't figure out how to control super intelligent machines, it could be anything, including complete existential catastrophe, and it could happen as soon as we have this machine. Of course. And I think to people who ask me for more numeric responses here or think that the field is delegitimized by not having those, I refer them to Alvin Weinberg, who coined, I believe, the term trans scientific and said there are some questions that are trans scientific, meaning you cannot construct those kinds of answers. And although this wasn't a problem at the time he did that, it would fall into that category. Is that something that you're familiar with that you would sign on to? So I, I think we can still give ranges and to show that the ranges are uncomfortable. So there mm. are certain inventions where you go, okay, there's zero chance this coffee cup will destroy humanity. It's safe to produce another coffee cup. I'm not at all concerned. I can give you zero. I feel mm. comfortable saying zero. I think most surveys, recent surveys of top machine conference, machine learning conferences, and these show that a very significant number are concerned about this technology and something like 15% think it's going to be really bad. That's an unacceptable number. Mm -hmm. That number needs to be much, much closer to zero to even consider building it. And more importantly, there is no reason why it has to be done in two years. We are not facing any deadline. We can totally wait until somebody does have a proof that it's controllable. Somebody has a working safety mechanism. What is the rush? The technology we have right now, current models, GPT-4 or similar, they are not integrated with economy. We can generate trillions of dollars of wealth just from what we have already. It has not been deployed. We have not lost millions of jobs to it. There is a lot of potential. So it's not an economic issue. Those systems can help us with research, with medical issues. We solved protein folding problem using narrow AI. There is no mm. need to create super intelligence if you want, for example, to live longer. Existing algorithms are capable of producing new drugs, new molecules, detecting cancers better. All of it is still not fully exploited. In terms of responses, we saw last year a couple of public letters, one calling for a moratorium for six months on training of large language models, the biggest ones, and another one saying that AI represented an existential threat, as we've been talking about. I'm not sure that they produced any effect other than possibly provoking some legislators to sit up and pay attention, which might have had some effect or might have some effect in the future. Do you see things like that, efforts like that, as being useful, going in the right direction, or have they so far been futile? I think they accomplished what they always accomplished. The signing something never changed the world, but it shows that, okay, you're not crazy. There is 10,000 computer scientists, top scholars, Turing Award winners, all saying this is a huge problem. It's no longer just me and Bostrom and Yudkovsky. It's really the best of the best making this argument. That's important. Mm. If you're looking for funding, if you're looking for other scholars to take on this research area, those are important changes. If majority of people will say, and I would love to see that presented as a possibility that we don't think you can solve this problem. We don't think you can control superintelligence. Then that's a very strong argument. You have to really justify why you playing God with the rest of humanity. You didn't get their consent. And even more so, you can't get that consent because there is no 
comprehension of what you're doing. It would not be informed consent. Nobody right. understands how their systems work or what they're going to do. So even if someone says, oh, I'm comfortable, go ahead and run it, they are not meaningfully consenting to anything. So let's run a thought experiment here. Definitely imagination run wild here. Let's say I give you a magic wand. So I'm turning you into fairy godfather. You can do anything with it. Yep. You can do anything you want with it except violate the laws of physics. Is there something that you could do with that that would produce a change in direction or result that would give you some assurance that we were heading in a productive direction with AI safety? So I believe in self-interest. I think it's against self-interest of leaders of those research groups, top labs, to kill themselves. They're not suicidal. They want to be rich. They want to be famous. They want to be successful. The way currently this is set up, this prisoner dilemma situation, you're winning by being the last one to stop. And that's very counterproductive. Yes, mm -hmm. you want government to force everyone to stop, but you want them to stop, then you are like six months ahead of everyone else. Then you get all the funds, you get all the glory, but no one dies. So we need to change this where everyone kind of reads my book and either finds a bug in it or goes, yeah, I understand there is no way to win it. The only chance to win is not to play. And we stop and we start monetizing what we have. And they still make trillions of dollars. Everyone's happy. And we have more time to either discover bugs in my arguments, solve that problem, or agree that, okay, at certain level, it's not worth moving forward. We got what we need here. Right. So those kinds of race to the bottom dynamics are usually, if not only, solved with legislation that says, okay, you're all going to stop now. And we're going to make you do that. Is that the thing that you would create by waving your wand? Yeah, it would be nice, but I don't think it will help anything. You cannot make this type of work illegal. We already made computer viruses illegal. We made ransomware illegal. Spam is illegal. It makes no difference. If you have open source models and anyone can play with them and a kid in a garage on a laptop can modify it, make it a million times faster. It's just a temporary annoyance that may siphon some resources from the compute towards the legal department. But long term, okay, we switch from two years to six years, which is good. I would like to see it, but it's not a solution to the problem. Stuart Russell has some work on, I think he calls it human compatible AI, a principle of developing AI, if I am putting this correctly, to train it to not take action until it is verified that what it's going to do is in alignment with human preferences. If I've phrased that accurately from your understanding, what is your take on that direction? So Stuart is a great scholar, brilliant scientist. I like him a lot. I don't fully understand how that solves the problem. So it may delay some parts of implementation. It may kind of give us more uncertainty about the outcomes. But at the end, you still have to figure out preferences, not just of one agent, but all 8 billion agents, somehow aggregate them where everyone's happy and all the impossibility results from economics, from political science show you cannot do that. There is not a voting system which captures that. And then you have to address all the malevolent actors whose preference it is to destroy the world. So there is so many problems with that that I don't think it will provide a complete solution we need mm. and certainly not in time we need it. Do you feel like the arguments for ways of preventing the problems that you're talking about amount to trying to argue with gravity? Like you're going to hit the ground. You might be able to flap your arms enough to delay it some, but that's about it. You will hit the ground because you're falling and that's what gravity does. Is it that level of inevitability? I think a better analogy is perpetual motion machines. Mm. We're trying to create a perpetual safety machine which is not just safe for this particular piece of software, but remains safe forever. It never stops being safe. As the system keeps growing, learning, self-modifying, improving, GPT-456, 24, million seven, it stays safe forever. We are never outsmarted. We always keep up. There is never an issue. Despite malevolent actors, despite open source code being accessible, psychopaths, terrorists, 
nothing changes the fact that that safety machine is always 100% safe. No one in security believes in 100% safety, even for narrow software with no intelligence. So to me, it's exactly the same. Tell me why you're trying to build this perpetual motion machine. Like, mm -hmm. you're not going to succeed. We know that. You've talked about the ways in which we've exhibited recklessness in developing the current state of the art of AI. The large language models, we're going full tilt on those. Security is an afterthought. People have immediately used them to do things that are reckless by all kinds of standards. If, and again, I've got the magic wand in the back of my mind here, so let's just go with that. The biggest risk to safety at the moment comes from the biggest models are being developed. The ones that are out on the frontier, the ones that use the huge amount of GPUs, where the development for the next version of Gemini and Llama and GPT-4 are coming from. If that research were to embody some principles of safety that it currently does not, but to become safer in ways like, for instance, what Stuart Russell is talking about, what effect do you think that would have on the problems that you're talking about? So I'm not sure specifically what is being included. If I'm right, if it's impossible mm. to do that, it doesn't really matter. At the end, they still will create a system so capable it's outside of their ability to control, explain, predict, and so on. Mm. And then we have no control over outcomes. We become like a child. We are maybe well taken care of, but we're definitely not in control. We don't decide anything. And we have no option of undoing that process at that point. It may very well serve business interests of those groups. I don't think they have a hard time getting funding or selling their products. Mm. Let me go back to the magic wand again. You use that to put yourself in charge of OpenAI and Google and Facebook and Amazon all at the same time. What, if anything, can you do in terms of directing the development of their products to buy us more time or make them safer? So switch all funding to deployment of products with existing technology until everyone's utilizing these models in their business infrastructure automating labor costs, there is absolutely no reason to even look at the next model. We have, again, enough to generate easily trillions of dollars in free labor, cognitive labor, physical labor. We have not even started with robotic automation. We're starting to create humanoid robots. We now have kind of brains for them. Where is my plumber? Where is my dishwasher? I mean, that's the market you want to tap into. Getting to GPT-6 first may be an easy way forward, but it's not capturing all the financial benefits and provides a lot of danger. So your response, if you were king for a day, president for a day, god for a day, would be to halt the development of these largest language models and maybe funnel that into embodiment research? Whatever deployment it is, it could be software deployment as well. We don't have a good assistant on my desktop right now, which really would replace my secretary. So mm -hmm. I think there is plenty to do in making existing systems safer, more reliable, less likely to be jailbroken. None of the systems we have today are 100% safe. The reports released by those companies, they talk about percentages. They're saying, oh, this is 20% more aligned, but it has a thousand times more capabilities. So it's actually less safe than the previous model. And every time they release a new one, it's exactly the same problem. It's now capable of doing more things in more unsafe ways, but as a percentage, it still looks reasonable. You've talked about being at a conference like NeurIPS or AAAI, and there being 10,000 people there, and then only 100 of them are attending anything to do with AI safety, which is a poor ratio. If you're speaking to those 10,000 people at once, you've got the stage to reach them. What do you say to convince them that more of them should join the field of AI safety? So I don't think that tweet or a speech will do what I'm trying to do with this book. I put a lot of time in trying to make the best arguments for why that's the most important problem, most interesting problem, why without solving this problem, we cannot move forward. Right. So this well, is then, really the one where you're going to make a name for yourself if you are successful. There is enough people who can move 
needle and more capable systems. You buy more processors, you add them, now you're winning that race. But in safety, it's not obvious that simply more compute gets you a safer system. In fact, in many cases, a more capable system became better at lying, cheating, being less safe. So that's the interesting domain. And any company which really wants to be able to sell their products and guarantee certain levels of safety, we're starting to see it with self-driving cars, for example. Can you guarantee, can you provide insurance for a car? That allows you to capture more of the market. Sure. It brings to mind the analogy of adding more computers, like taking a nuclear reactor and packing more enriched uranium in and saying more must be better because at some point you reach critical mass and then you have a very different kind of result. What are the bigger problems in AI safety right now that need to be researched, need more people researching where you would, if you were recruiting and you had money to recruit people with, you would say, look, come and work on this. What is that problem? So we're actually kind of trying to create this community. We published this survey paper in ACM Computing Surveys Journal, which is a very good journal. We look at about 50 plus in possibility results. And I had time to maybe look at, I don't know, a dozen in terms of how they impact safety and capabilities in control. But for every other one, we know there are things we cannot do, but we haven't analyzed, do we need those capabilities? Is this a tool we actually need? Maybe it's not relevant, but maybe it's an important bottleneck. And to solve safety alignment control, we'll have to find approximate solutions to all those impossibility results. So for me, that's a great way to quickly pick up and start moving in that direction. Would you say that AI safety is a field where there are few enough people in it that someone entering it now could quickly make a name for themselves? Certainly, and we see it all the time. I mean, the so-called leaders in the safety movement two years ago, we didn't exist. So it's very easy. So you say in the book that uh, higher intelligences, super intelligences will control lower intelligences. If I've misphrased that, I'm sure you'll correct me. But it seems to me that there are counterexamples now that you, a uh, brilliant professor, uh, work for and have your career influenced and decided by administrators who I would suggest are not as brilliant. And if you want to respond to something that's a little less politically dangerous, then I would submit that the legislators in Washington are demonstrably less intelligent than yourself and the uh, intelligent class, and yet they have control over your funding environment, the rules that you follow, and, and so forth. How does that modify your argument? Well, I don't think they have any control. They have influence. They can impact my environment in certain ways, but they certainly don't control what I do, what I try to do. I try to game the system as much as I can to avoid their influence, right? It's like saying I can run up to a person in the street and punch them in the face. That will change their actions. I'm not controlling them. I'm just an annoying part of the environment. They'll do everything they can to stop me, to prevent me from doing it. More advanced intelligence, in theory, can closely monitor and perfectly influence a lower level of intelligence, but it's not the same in the opposite direction. Is there a point then at which the intelligence gap becomes so great that any advantage due to some position of control or being a sociopath becomes overwhelmed by that greater level of intellect? Well, I think the moment you have some additional capability, the danger starts to accumulate. So you may be decisively more capable or slightly more capable or maybe just dangerous enough in certain situations. All of those could be problematic. We already have systems which are super intelligent in certain domains. So they play chess better than any human, but in many other domains, they are subhuman. Mm. So if there is a system which is super intelligent in the domain of developing dangerous pathogens, that could be problematic even if it's still kind of dumb and everything else and we kind of control a lot of the other capabilities. Right. So we talk about different types of intelligence in human beings and then they're the ones that are tested for by intelligence tests, but then people talk about, for instance, emotional intelligence and, and the like, which are perhaps under less development with respect to artificial intelligence. Would training AI 
on some of those more unconventional types of intelligence produce interesting results? Well, I think they are very good at persuasion and kind of making up facts to convince you. They are literally trained to please you and make you happy with them, regardless of how honest or accurate they are. Mm -hmm. I think Sam Altman tweeted about this ability, super intelligent ability to convince as being one of the very important properties of their systems. Definitely, we see it in terms of Benefits for marketing, for social network systems, if you can convince users to buy a product or click on a link or even stay engaged, that's exactly what we're rewarding them for. So I think it would be super intelligent in terms of manipulating humans. Mm. And that is certainly one of the things where we've seen perhaps the large language models leapfrog our expectations in that they went right to that ability to, for instance, talk themselves out of the box uh, that we might have wanted to keep them in, in some experiments, quite capably. That's actually funny. So a decade ago, a lot of my research was on boxing AI and trying to figure out how to keep it from accessing internet. Whereas in reality, what we did is immediately connected it to the internet and released open source models. So all of that research became useless before it was even deployed. Right. And it turned out to be quite good at that. There was that famous example of ChatGPT, I believe, asking a human to solve a capture for it, yeah. to solve a problem, and then lying about why it needed that done. So not very encouraging. Well, time is drawing to a close here. What have I not discussed from your book that you'd like to draw attention to? The beautiful book cover, of course. <laughs> How did you create that? I didn't. I was uh, lucky enough to get permission from the creator. It was a meme which was viral for a while and they were kind enough to let me use it. And I think it captures exactly what the current state of AI safety is. It's all about putting lipstick on a pig. You have this monster model, very unsafe, very mm -hmm. unknown, but we're trying to create filters for it. We're saying, okay, don't say that word. Whatever you do, don't say that word. And if we succeed at that, we think we made the model safe. We are not even working at the level of making the model safe. We're just creating filters, smoke and mirrors. I think that's the fundamental problem a lot of people don't realize. Well, it's been a great pleasure, as always, talking with you. If your book landed on the desks of every congressperson, senator, every legislator with any influence in the world... What would you want them to do with it after they've read it? Well, legislation which buys us more time is a good thing. We had this, you mentioned, letter which called for six months of moratorium. We should have a similar process, but not time limited. We should ask for capabilities-based moratorium until you can show us how your system does X, Y, Z and why you're guaranteeing the following safety capabilities you should not be able to proceed with this. And I think if I'm right, that becomes a permanent stop mm. to that level of novel research. And if I'm wrong, it just buys us enough time to get those capabilities. So it's a win-win. Well, thank you for writing the book. It's AI, unexplainable, unpredictable, uncontrollable. And it's an unforgettable read. So I encourage everyone to go out and get that read that, take it to heart. And Roman, where else should they go to find out more about what you're doing in the future? Oh, uh, social media is great. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. Feel free to follow me. And those don't follow me home, that's the only request I have. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you again for joining us. And thank you for writing this book. Thank you. And that's the end of the interview. You can find links to Roman's book in the show notes and transcript. In today's news ripped from the headlines about AI, Bill Gates has said in a blog post that he predicts we will have AI personal executive assistants within five years. That might not be a shock to regular listeners of this podcast because we've had guests predicting that for nearly four years now, starting with Taiwanese digital minister Audrey Tang all the way back in episode three. But it's nice for Bill to give the idea some fresh exposure. He said that agents will be able to assist their users with, quote, virtually any activity and any area of life. 
If your friend just had surgery, your agent will offer to send flowers and be able to order them for you. If you tell it you'd like to catch up with your old college roommate, it will work with their agent to find a time to get together. And just before you arrive, it will remind you that their oldest child just started college at the local university. We have discussed exactly this scenario in episodes 34 and 35 with Michael Waldridge, whose field of research is multi-agent systems. This sounds all well and good, but we have to remember that we have to come to terms with the privacy issue first. Many people will point to some failing of AI as proof that it's not as good as a human. Like, for instance, how Alexa may interrupt you when you're in the middle of a deeply moving conversation to remind you of some inane thing, like it's time to take down the laundry. A human assistant would be sensitive to the mood of the moment. But if you tell them that an AI assistant could do that, provided it could listen to everything that was being said around it and correlate the conversations with other personal data about the people it recognized, they would call foul and say that AI should not have access to such personal information. Well, you can't have it both ways. A human assistant is only able to be effective by being trusted with very personal and private information about their employer. I predict that once people see the kind of benefits they could get from doing that, essentially everyone getting their own butler, even though it wouldn't bring you martinis, then a great many people would be willing to give access to that information to AIs. Next week, we'll be talking with science writer Eve Herald about her new book, Robots and the People Who Love Them. Find out about the ways we love robots, and much more, next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.